So last week, we returned back to uh, the beginning of the book of Revelation. Remember, we looked at the end, and then we went back to the beginning. And um, what was your assignment for the week? Revelation. Get fat, eat a lot of food. Get fat, eat a lot of food. Watch for, the watch for the blessings. Absolutely, watch for the blessings. And um, all of you that are friends with Jimmy on Facebook, take time to log on to her page and look at her list of blessings on there. Oh, um, the absolutely, absolutely amazing insight that she's listed on there. Um, she had she she not only listed the things that you would normally think are blessings, but also the things that are more tragedy than blessing. But she she's looking at um, how those tragedies have blessed her um, in the past year. And it's just uh, a great insight. And for me, it helped me to think a little more outside the box um, than what I normally do. And I know that's strange because I really think outside the box a lot. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even have a box. It's just maybe an invisible bubble. I don't even know that I have a bubble. <laughs> I was in college and they, the uh, professor asked what our calendars look like. And, and everybody was giving these big theological answers and everything because it was a bible. It was, a, it was, it was actually a, um, uh, a, a seminary. So um, they're all giving these huge answers, and so he came around to me and he says, What's your, what does your schedule look like, Dan? And I said, well, you take a, a pan of water, and you take a pan, pour water in it, and just move it around like this, and that's my schedule. Mm -hmm. That's what my schedule looks like, completely fluid. I can change it at one, as long as everything gets done that's in there, it doesn't matter when it gets done or how it gets done, or that's, that's fluid, and that's kind of like my whole life. That's how I look at things, not inside a box, but kind of, uh, kind of fluid. And um, that has helped me in my study of Revelation. And I know that, uh, I, I pick on Chris a lot, <laughs> but he's, he's, he, kind of my study buddy in a, in a sense that he looks at things a little bit different than I do. And uh, he's like, well, what about this and this and this? And gives me, you know, these points to. But he, he's kind of he's kind of strict in his formation when it comes to um, looking at the scripture. And I'm, I, I don't hold hard and fast to, to some of the rules that are out there. So, um... We, uh, we have fun batting it back and forth. And I would so much like it if some of you that have been reading the book and you're following along in the studies, if you would message me about the questions you have. Because I would so much like to just kind of bat those ideas back and forth and engage you outside of church about the Word of God. And I think that would help me and it will help you to, uh, to learn. And then I know that you're reading the scriptures and that you're not just going through your daily life and forgetting about God completely. Because I know that's the tendency for us to do. And um, so if you would, I, I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to read chap uh, the first part of chapter 1 in Revelation, Daniel, um, that we did last week as, as a precursor to today. And um, I did that in I did that in the New Living Testament last week. And so it reads, "This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place." He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. 
And so we, you know, looked at the blessings and we looked at the introduction and we specifically looked at the time is near, that we are close to the end. All right, and there's, <laughs> there's some more stuff that's revealed in here uh, as we move on that is, is, is just going to blow your mind. It's, 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 you know, clarified things for me of where we are in this timeline of the end times. And so let's go ahead and move on. I'm going to switch versions. We're going to switch to the New King James. And we're going to read the section of Scripture for today, which is chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. And I know, Chris, you're going to want me to go a lot further than that. <laughs> You'll be like, no, now I'm behind. But I'm sure that that will give you some extra time to look at those things that you're wanting to look at. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come out this morning, Lord, to be in your house, uh, to find your safety. And Lord, with everything going on, we know that we need to turn to you even more. That we need to rest in you, find our peace in you. Peace has so much eluded most of the country right now. With all the unrest with the, uh, with the election and, and with the virus, Lord, you're the only one that we can turn to, to find relief. We ask that you be our, our de-stressor. Lord, that we can lay everything at your feet. We can take our burdens and our stress and our worries off our own shoulders and lay them at your feet. And that you would love us. And care for us. And that you put your hand on our shoulder and say, say, don't be scared. We ask for your blessings, Lord. And as we look into your word this morning, we ask that we can understand it. That we can unpack it in such a way that um, the mysteries would fade away. And that you would give us an application that would better us as Christians. Make us more holy, closer to you. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. I shut off the sleep thingy on it. It's not supposed to fall asleep when I shut off the sleep thingy, is it? <laughs> All right. So we see John, one of the sons of Zebedee. He is um, one of uh, one of Jesus' favorite, and he is. Taken up into heaven, and he's writing this letter. It says John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Um, Asia Minor, today's equivalent to modern Turkey, is where these churches were. And um, the churches, there's seven of them, seven postal districts of the area. So the seven cities served as central points of communication. So, 
this is one of the questions that uh, that Chris asked me. Why these cities? And uh, this is why those cities, partially why those cities. Because they're getting a letter written to them, but it's not just specifically to them. It's going to be used for all of the churches. And actually, these seven, these seven um, uh, churches that they're writing to, seven cities that they're writing to, represents all of Christianity. The number seven is the, the number of completion. So, so in essence, he's, this is a, a, a near, far prophecy type of thing where, yes, he's writing to those seven churches in those seven cities, but it has application for us even today, this far away, this far out. And so, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. <coughs> okay. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is and who is to come. We see there's going to be a pattern that's going to come out here, and we see who is and who was. So we see a present tense and a past tense and a who is to come, a future tense. Okay? And so we're talking, of, of course, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, it says, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we see right here the Holy Trinity in the book of Revelation. So we can see the Holy Trinity throughout the Bible too, can't we? Although the Holy Spirit is somewhat obscure in the Old Testament, becomes prevalent in the New Testament, especially after Jesus' death on the cross, and Jesus says, I will send you a helpmate. I will send you a helper to help you through the rough times, right? So it's this Holy Spirit that indwells us once we become a Christian. And so we see that being talked about here. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So seven is the number of perfection. And we see the, the uh, number of perfection being attached to the spirit. So it could be the Holy Spirit. Also, we can also look at this as the seven churches or the seven lampstands that are around the throne. All right? So, which is the complete church or the church which God watches over. The, faith, um, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, Christ is the first to have raised from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Catch that. That's important. Jesus was the first one to be raised from the dead and he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. I hope you find peace in that. Because whatever happens with our judicial system here in the United States, doesn't matter who's in there, Jesus is the ruler over that person. Amen. He is still in control. And how he's going to work all that out, I have no idea. But we have to have faith in him that he's going to work it out somehow for our good or for the good of those who love him. Amen? Amen. So, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So he's made us kings does that sound, are we kings? It's actually, he has, and I, I like how the, uh, the New Living Testament puts this. Um, he has made a kingdom of priests uh, for God, his Father. So he hasn't made us kings. 
He has made a kingdom, his heavenly kingdom of priests. And we are priests. We're his ambassadors. And that's what that means there. Um, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. So now here we, here we hear a remnant of Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. And the Son of Man will come with the clouds of heaven. You start to see a pattern here that's going on. Because we're not just talking about the book of Revelation. We're not just talking about the end times. We're not just talking about what John has seen. Jesus and, and God and, and, and the Holy Trinity is pulling everything together here from the whole of the, of the history of the Bible. Everything. From the Old Testament through the New Testament. He's wrapping it all up for us so that we have a, a complete view of the Bible. And I, I think it's absolutely amazing how he does this. Behold, he is coming with clouds. And we talk about you know, all the passages in the New Testament where it says Jesus is coming quickly and, 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 he, and with the sound of the trumpet and the clouds will open and, and they'll come and these aren't just regular clouds, they're the clouds of glory. He's coming with, with clouds of glory. And it says, make sure that you're what? Make sure that it's not on a Sabbath day. <laughs> Make sure that you're ready. Make sure that, make sure, and what that means is make sure it's not on a Sabbath day. Make sure that you're not resting. Because if you're, if you're resting and not ready, you may be in trouble. So be sure that you're ready because Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is, and here we see it again, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. And he wraps it all up, doesn't he? I'm not even, I'm not even through with, with chapter one yet. We're not even actually into the, the vision for the churches. All we've got is the introduction where, where John's writing to the churches. And it says in verse 9. I, John, both your brother and com com companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island called Patmos for the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So, John, he's telling us exactly where he is. I'm your companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience. So we're going through tribulation for the kingdom and trying to relay the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ as we go through all the trials of our life. And John says, and you know what, all of this, I'm on Patmos, which was a Roman penal colony. And why was he on Patmos? He was there, stop it, he was there, <laughs> um, because of the testimony that he had in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he was a preacher, he was a witness for Jesus, and they didn't agree with that. And so exiled to Patmos. And he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So is this the Lord's day, the, the day at the end, the judgment day? No, this is the Lord's day, the Sabbath, on the Lord's day, on the day of rest. I was resting. I was, I was in my slumber. And as I rested, I became in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, Can you, I need you to imagine this for just one minute. 
you're, you're, on this, you're on this island, it's only 25 square miles. All right, so it's not a huge island, it's a small island. Most of it's rocky, uh, uncomfortable, not, not a lot of resting places, but, but you finally found a place to relax. And so it's, it's on Saturday, and you're finally relaxing, and you're kind of chilled out, and, and after, after all of the horrors that you've been through, you're finally at peace and relaxing, and maybe just dozed off, and all of a sudden, somebody walks up to you with a trumpet and blows it as loud as he can right in your ear. Some of you are laughing because you have kids and grandkids and this has happened to you. Well, you know what? I have one of those little air horns and, and I have from time to time in the church here went, yeah, and I've seen all of you go like this. Can you imagine? See, a trumpet is just, is just something that, that uh, John, can, John understands. So that's what he uses for his, for his example. But if John had understood an air horn, he might have said air horn instead of trumpet, because an air horn is a lot louder than a trumpet. If you took that air horn and ran out to somebody's ear, this is how loud the sound is that John was awakened in the spirit. No wonder he's in the spirit. He jumped half out of his skin. <laughs> And what does he hear this voice say? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And oh my, just, and what you see right in a book, and I'm sure John is thinking, okay, let me go wipe myself, and then I'll come write it down, because you scared me half to death. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Samaria, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turn to see the voice. <laughs> then I turn to see who's yelling at me. <laughs> I wonder if he didn't recognize who it was, or he just, he just wanted to see, okay, I want to see what you look like. You know, because John's never seen, I, I don't know, God the Father? I, I don't know. Then I turn to see the voice. That spoke at me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. So now we see the seven golden lampstands. The golden lampstands, we'll see, represent the seven churches, or the church complete. The church itself is protected around the throne of God, protected around Jesus Christ. He is guarding the churches. And I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool. And as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. Oh, that's kind of scary. His feet were fine bread, were like fine brass, and if refined in a furnace, as if refined in a furnace, his voice was like the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if dead. Now, we need to notice that all through this, every time he, he, he describes something about Jesus, he is saying, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like. And he just doesn't, he's just searching for words to explain what he's seeing. Sometimes when we've seen something for the first time and we're trying to explain it, we, we have to use other words that are familiar to us. Because there's just, how, how do you explain something that you've never seen before? And I, I'm positive that all of this is not giving justice to the actual sight that John is seeing right now. The beauty, the majesty, the authority, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we were to try to look too deeply into all of these, all of this figurative language, we could run down a huge deep rabbit trail. 
And we can really waste a lot of time, can't we? We have to be careful when we approach the book of Revelation to identify what's figurative and what's literal. It's easy right here to identify it because he says his eyes are like a flame of fire. Should we just throw Bible study methods out the window, throw exegesis out the window and say his eyes are on fire? That doesn't make any sense, does it? But yet some people do that. And so they, they would draw a picture, and I've seen pictures drawn of Jesus Christ all, all yeah, all fanciful with using these characteristics. That's absolutely not true, not even close to right. So we need to be careful when we're reading the scripture. And look here, it says, and I fell at his feet as dead. He didn't die. He just fell like, like a rag doll at the feet of Jesus. Just, just almost like his, his, his heart exploded in his chest. He's like, Boom. just floored at this amazing person that he's looking at. Can't even believe that he's seeing God in all his glory. And I love this part. But he laid his right hand on me. He laid his right hand on me. The right hand is important. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he sat at the right hand of the Father. And we will be at the right hand of Jesus. And so it's a symbolism. And so Jesus laid his right hand and he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I think I'd have a tendency to still be afraid. <laughs> I'd be like, but, 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 but. But, 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 uh, mm, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I am the first and the last. I am, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am forevermore. And we see that again, past, present, future. It's, um, uh, yeah. He who lives and was dead. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And this is a, another very, very important thing to look at here. See, Jesus went down, descended into Hades, and took the keys from the devil himself. He took the keys... And then he ascended into heaven. He's like, now I've got the keys to Hades and of death. And actually, they're the same, they're, they're the same thing. It, both words mean the same thing, but um, the dead go to Hades, and the Hades is the place of the dead. And what it's saying here is that Jesus controls who lives and who dies. And if Jesus controls who lives and who dies, we have to question, Jesus, what the heck are you doing? Because some people have died that we think should still be alive. And some people that are still alive, we think that they should have gone long ago. But it's not right for us to question Jesus, is it? It's not right for us to question Him who is king. And so he says, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place. Here we go. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place. It follows 
the same past, present, future, doesn't it? Write the things which are. Write the things which you have seen. So write everything that you've already seen so far. Write the things which are. Those are the letters to the seven churches which he's fixing to write. So the seven churches present tense. So, so many people have said, oh, these churches represent geographical um, times, uh, dispensations through time. And we can see that, oh, the church was this way during this time period, and it was this way during this time period, and go on for seven time periods, and then the last church that was listed is the present day church. But that's, that doesn't follow proper exegesis. It doesn't follow what Jesus is saying here. Because those things that which are now are the seven churches in the whole, in the whole of the book of, the, of, of Revelation. There's no other way to separate that. Because after chapter 3 is over with, what do we move to? We move to the throne room of God, don't we? So, and, and from the throne room of God, we're moving to the scrolls and the bowls and all the things that are going to be unleashed on the earth within the seven year tribulation period. That's certainly future. That has not happened yet. So this, at the seven churches, has to be, has to be the things that are happening now. So, they're just, the seven churches are that, that distribution hub. That way to get the word out, get this the future message out to all the other churches around. And the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, and here's the mystery. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. So a complete view of these lampstands around the throne of God. The churches are around the throne of God. And God is watching them. And I'm going to finish up here real quick. The seven stars are the angels. And there's this huge debate over, okay, are they angels? Or are they really the pastors of the churches? Because it doesn't make any sense for... For um, an angel or an angel or Jesus to be telling um, John to write to another angel, because if he's going to write to another angel, he can just go ahead and tell that angel it's just probably right there by the lampstand or wherever you put it. So is it is he actually writing to pastors, the pastors of the churches? It doesn't really make any difference if we want to follow. If we want to follow the general use of the word angel throughout the book of Revelation, it doesn't refer to pastors. It refers to um, a heavenly being, one created by God and lives in the heavenly realm. And it's perfectly understandable that God has put angels to watch over His churches. Because we pray for a hedge of protection around us and around our church. And we're asking for our angels to watch over our church and to watch over us and to take care of us because that's their job. And I, 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 I think that that assessment is about the best one that, that we can have. And it really doesn't matter right or wrong. If it's a pastor, so the pastor is, is supposed to watch over the church. We'll look at that a little bit further next week when we look at the actual letters to the seven churches. Now before I pray, is there any questions? Okay, when you're going through the seven churches, it said Philadelphia. Well, I watched a video the other day that referred to the church in Philadelphia, our Philadelphia, that where the Declaration of Independence and all the stuff for our country underneath Jesus was called the Sixth Church. By, it was by a pastor. Our Philadelphia here? Yes. No. <laughs> With Because they went through everything about our country being under, underneath the built of Christianity is that what was 
and, and that's that's one of those dispensational views, um, and except for they pulled it out of time and, and uh, attributed it to Philadelphia in the United States. Right. Um, it's a it's a it's a gross oversight and a stretch. It's trying to take scripture and contort it. Um, there's no there's no way we can reasonably. Um, uh, attribute the seven church, especially the names of the seven churches listed here, um, to modern day times. Um, we can certainly get an application, and we'll see that next week. We'll have an application for today, but as far as the literal church itself was back then, yeah, it's it's not today. Because yeah. they had the same name, well, Philadelphia, I, Philadelphia. I, there's I, no I, coincidence or something. Yeah. I, yeah, you know, um, TV shows like to like to do, and I've seen lots of scholars that are on TV shows that like to stretch things a little bit to make their theories work, so to speak. I'm just going to help you a little bit him on Philadelphia, the church that was called Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Then my angle, our discussion, my angle is more historical. Um, the churches as we see them in scripture right. don't even have those same names anymore. Now, in a modern no. time. No, they don't. So, the Philadelphia that was that. Okay. I have a funny question. Yeah. Um, I don't like The Jewish people, they celebrate Hanukkah because um, the oil that was supposed to run out, but Jesus, or God made it last. Wasn't it seven days? When the oil... The lamps. The oil and the lamps were supposed to last seven days. It was supposed to be... There was only enough oil for one day, but God made it last for seven days. Wasn't that seven days? Yeah. Yes. Doesn't that mean how there's that number seven again? The number of perfection, yeah. Uh, lots, lots of times when, when, when we're talking about God and the things that he does, it comes up in sevens. Yeah, absolutely. And, huh? He did the world in the Yeah, he did the world. Yes, exactly. And let me let me elaborate just a little bit on the, you know, and I know you're talking about, um, I, I want to relate that to the lampstands here. And, we said, you know, as far as the oil in the lamps, oil often refers to the Holy Spirit. And so the lampstands of the churches can also mean the Holy Spirit within the churches um, because the oil that's in the lampstand. So, I, yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting... I just never heard about the number seven being like that. Mm -hmm. going, wow, that's really... Yeah, it's not... It's, it's, it's often not a literal number seven, but uh, it can, it, you know, both ways, uh, a, a figurative meaning of the number seven. Six, six, six is just the opposite. Go ahead. See, in the video I was watching by this pastor, he was saying pro with the casino and the winning number is 777 seven, seven, when you play the slots and everything else and he was tying tied that the church in Philadelphia was that he was part of our uh, how do you say uh, what he was looking at is he is part of the whole picture so Trump was part of the whole picture as a reborn Christian here to fight stuff in, in the United States okay um, and and I, I, I've heard that, um, and I've heard uh, people trying to attribute it, attribute what's going on in the United States to the end times, right. and you know, a completion of what's of what's been written that has to, this must must have to happen before. Let me, let me rest rest assured, the United States has nothing to do with what's written in the Bible. Okay, the United States is not mentioned in the Bible. The, it, it's not in view of the Bible. There is, it wasn't even. Right. Now, of course, we have applications that we use from, from throughout the Bible to apply to our situation today, but the United States is not mentioned in the Bible. And, um, you know, fl and flying grasshoppers are not, the, are not helicopters, and uh, we'll get into that <laughs> as we move through the study, but um, it's, it's just <coughs> people like to be fanciful, and they like to feel important, so... And since the United States is built on God and, and all this, it's got to be the epicenter for everything that's going to happen in the Bible to complete prophecy. It's not true. None of that's true. If you, if you want to see...
Prophecy being fulfilled and completed, put your eyes towards the Middle East, off towards Israel and what's going on, and in Turkey and what's going on over there. So it's, it has nothing, nothing at all to do with Trump or who's, who's going to be our next president or what way the United States turns or anything like that. It all has to do with the Middle East. Now, we can affect what happens in the Middle East, but that doesn't mean that, that we're... Um, that were forefront in the Bible, or any, or any kind of one even mentioned. So, yeah, I, I knew that. It's just something that this pastor was talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just, and it was if I was if I was watching that, I would have been. I wouldn't have been able to sit still. I would have been probably yelling and throwing some things at the screen and things like that. You've done that. Okay. If there's no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to wrap up. And if you do have questions through the week and you're reading and you know you want to you want to know some further stuff on what we've already looked at, not I'm not going to jump ahead, but what we've already looked at, go ahead and message me um, on the Facebook or you can either uh, cross culture the cross culture Facebook or the cafe culture Facebook or my personal, and uh, we can have good discussion on all that stuff. Let's pray, Father God. Oh Lord, we. Uh, <laughs> We're excited about uh, the upcoming snow, and we're excited about uh, the Christmas coming up, and we just ask that, uh, Lord, you take the uh, take all the sickness and put it away, and that, that we can be over that, and that you would settle our country, and uh, that you would uh, make opportunities for us to, to witness and to bring your kingdom a little bit closer. Lord, we ask that, uh, that you would um, help us to grow more in you, that we would be more like you, more holy, uh, more settled in our nature, um, that's more comfortable in you, that we can come to you with anything and, and we would know you um, on a personal level. Lord, we thank you so much for the church and we thank you for your scripture and your word and, and thank you for... Uh, giving it to us that we can study and know you better. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
pray your blessings down on us this week. May we serve you with everything we are. In Jesus' name, go in peace.